Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today I want to talk to you about ABL Space Systems, a rocket company that you may not have heard of, but they've been very successful at getting investments from the likes of Lockheed Martin without revealing too much about themselves. They've managed to raise over $400 million in private investments without going the SPAC route. And Lockheed has agreed to buy up to 58 launches from this small rocket startup. Amazon has contracted with them to launch an early Kuiper satellite, and NASA has a mission with them as well. So despite sharing very little in public, they've convinced a lot of people that they're worth supporting. Unfortunately, this week they got some undesired attention when a plume of black smoke was seen over Mojave Spaceport, and the company confirmed that they had been running a test on the second stage of their RS-1 rocket when something went catastrophically wrong. While details are thin on the ground, the most important news out of this is that nobody has been injured as a result. However, I can imagine that losing a rocket stage in testing is going to delay their debut launch, which has been a few months away for the last year or so. So the first time I heard of ABL or ABEL was in uh, mid-2018 when they announced a small, but not that small, satellite launch vehicle. The targeted payload mass to orbit was about 650 kilograms. The RS-1 was supposed to use high-performance rocket engines being developed by Ursa Major and dirt simple tank architecture, their words not mine, to rapidly develop a launch vehicle to get into the market quickly. The founders and many other employees uh, have links to SpaceX and other uh, rocket companies. Some of them worked there for over a decade, uh, so the company can boast a lot of direct experience in rocket design and manufacturing. Uh, their website actually lists many of the people, many more people than you'd expect on the average uh, you know, rocket website. Uh, people that basically that have worked for other companies that have already built working launch vehicles, you know, things like Virgin Orbit, Astra, um, okay, Blue Origin as well. So yeah, this company is built by people with a lot of experience and they likely just wanted to head out on their own so that they could be a big fish in a small pond, so to speak. You know, it's, it's a startup environment and I understand this. I spent most of my software developer life working at startups because startups are fun. You know, again, you have a much more direct link with the product. And I'm guessing, by the way, ABL Space Systems is supposed to sound like ABLE Space Systems, but maybe I'm missing something. Maybe there's an acronym I haven't... Uh, been informed about. So anyway, the company was founded in 2017 and yeah, and they announced their RS-1 rocket in early 2018. And this was on the larger end of the small sat launch vehicles, larger than Rocket Lab or Astro's vehicle and more comparable in terms of payload to that of Firefly or Relativity. The rocket is largely built out of machined and welded aluminium rather than the carbon composites fav uh, favoured by Rocket Lab or Firefly or the fancy 3D printed structures that Relativity are pioneering. The original design of the RS-1 was 70 feet tall and 60 inches in diameter. That's about 22 metres tall and about 1.5 metres in diameter. And it was supposed to be powered by engines developed by Ursa Major Technologies. Now, the first stage would be powered by two Ripley engines and the second a single Hadley engine. Yes, get those references. But both are high-performance, closed-cycle, kerosene LOX engines using oxidizer-rich stage combustion. The, the oxidizer-rich cycle with kerosene is the engine design favoured by the former Soviet rocket engine builders. They pioneered this. And there's been a couple of attempts to build US engines that do this, but no US rocket has launched using a US engine with this high-performance uh, engine cycle. So anyway, the design was anticipated to be able to launch you know, 650 kilograms into low Earth orbit and a target price of $17 million. Also, it was designed to operate using minimal ground support equipment, right? They would, everything would be moved around in shipping containers, including like the launch control center and the ground service equipment. The rocket would go on a trailer which meant that they could launch from a whole bunch of different sites. They've talked about Cape Canaveral, Vandenberg, 
Kodiak up in Alaska, and even Camden Spaceport in Georgia, which is a uh, one that hasn't had an orbital launch. But for me, perhaps the most interesting launch site that's been attached to them is the Shetland Islands uh, north of Scotland. It's known as Saxa Vord Spaceport after the biggest, the uh, tallest mountain on the island. This is a proposed site on the island of Unst. Uh, near an old RAF base. So far, it's still going through the legal paperwork and may not get be approved and become operational, but Lockheed Martin wants able to launch from there. And by the way, this is a different uh, location than Spaceport Sutherland, which, despite the name, is actually located on land in the north coast of Scotland. That site is also working through its legal and environmental requirements, and it has Orbex and Skyrora both lined up as users. So it's entirely possible that ABLE could make the first orbital launch from Scotland, and possibly the UK, and possibly Western Europe. But I'm getting ahead of things. You know, the Shetland option wasn't discussed until 2021, and there's a few significant changes to the rocket design before we got there. In fact, by the end of 2018, the engine selection had changed. No longer were they going to use Ursa Major, but instead they decided to develop their own engines in-house, the rather less poetically named E1 and E2. But their intended engine design is a much simpler open cycle engine that loses about 10% performance over a closed cycle engine. So this change of plans means more work up front uh, and lower performance in exchange for lower ongoing costs per launch. The rocket also got a bit bigger, expanding its diameter to 1.8 meters or 6 feet and adding a third engine to raise the payload to over a ton despite the less efficient engines that they would use. But, you know, developing rocket engines is not an easy task. I mean, rocket science has a reputation for a reason. So developing two rocket engines would be twice as difficult. So it's understandable that the design subsequently changed to only using the E2 engine for both stages. And this is very similar to what we see at SpaceX and Rocket Lab, where both have, um, you know, nine engines in the first stage and a second stage with a single vacuum optimized engine, primarily stretch nozzle and maybe a changed throat diameter. Interestingly, the nine engines in this are laid out in a circle without a central engine as seen on Falcon 9 and Electron. So that would preclude recovery of this stage, but maybe they'll change their mind about that later. The E2 engine is an all 3D printed design generating about six tons of thrust and they've been testing this for a couple of years now. According to ABLE, it's also being designed to run on regular Jet A propellant rather than the more refined RP-1 found in other rockets. And that's something that could be a big deal or a big problem. It's a lot easier to get Jet A, which makes it a lot easier you know, to, op to operate in locations where you don't have regular supplies of RP-1 available. It's also about one-fifth of the cost of RP-1, but you know, cost of the propellant is kind of small compared to the cost of the rocket. There's also a reason why rockets use RP-1. Like almost every US rocket that uses RP-1, they use it for regenerative cooling of the combustion chamber. And one of the reasons for the higher purity and stricter specifications is that they want to remove molecules that can cause a fuel to polymerize into thick, viscous gunk under heat and pressure, which will very quickly ruin your day if they block uh, your cooling channels. There can also be problems with things like sulfur reacting with nickel in the engine structure, and also the looser standards of Jet A means that you have more variation in the density of propellant, so you don't necessarily have as much control over how much propellant you put in your first stage. I, I'm not sure what a ABLE are actually planning to do about this in effect, you know, whether they're just running the engine at pressures and temperatures that are outside the range where polymerization might be a problem, or maybe they're trying to use liquid oxygen as a coolant for their system as well. That's a feature that hasn't been really seen on US engines. Or, you know, maybe they just think this might work, and when it doesn't, they're going to quietly drop the claim. Either way, in 2018, they plan to launch in 2020. But over time, that date has slipped to the right, and it's now 2022, and we're, ex we're expecting a launch a few weeks from now. We actually saw documents which had January 31st as a target date. That's obviously not going to happen now, since they have to probably put everything on hold 
as they try to figure out what happened with the, the upper stage on the test stand and whether it's something that they need to fix in the rocket before they attempt to go to space. So yeah, um, Able Space Systems, we don't have a lot of information on them. That's what I know. I think that given the amount of investment they have, they could make a serious go at this and they could certainly grab a niche in the launch market. So best of luck to Able. I hope to see you flying in space soon. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.